Hey everyone, thanks for coming to another Quality Advocates event. Um, at this time we've got Iwana giving her talk on assuring or not assuring quality. Uh, she talked through the ideas and, and how um, what she's implemented in uh, Wealth Wizards massively benefited their approach to implementing that quality first piece. Um, it's sure to be a great talk, I've heard a lot of good things about it, so Iwana if you're ready it would be great to get us underway. Hi, you hear me? Yeah? All good. Perfect. Okay. Uh, if you see me looking here, it's because I have another monitor and oh, I just glimpsed uh, to it. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, hi from uh, from Barcelona. I see someone here uh, as well. Uh, thank you all for, for being here and for taking the time. Um, uh, to, to join us tonight. Uh, I'm going to try to be as brief as possible, uh, but I, I still know it, it could be quite lengthy at times uh, because um, I'm still trying to, to go through the talk and um, review it. So uh, hopefully uh, in 40 minutes uh, I, can, I can answer some questions as well. So um, if we start, um, who am I? I'm an uh, automation quality assurance engineer uh, with a background uh, in uh, automation testing. Um, I'm keen to improve quality in, in both the, the software and delivery practices, and currently I'm head of quality engineering at, at Wolf Wizards. I'm also a massive in, in, introvert, and that's why I like to, to put that on, on my slide, at least to see uh, as a, I don't know, starting point, I guess, of discussion. Um, as an agenda, what I'm going to go uh, through today, uh, I'm going to try and go a bit uh, through the journey that we've been through. Uh, so where we are as an engineering team, uh, what's our vision, uh, what's actually, what was the reality and what made us to, to make a couple of changes in, in our team. Um, what actually triggered triggered that change. And then in the end, we're going to have a look at a couple of experiments that we've done, some techniques, some a couple of learnings that uh, we've had in, in the last uh, year, where we are today, and then uh, we're going to close with um, how we evolved as a QA chapter uh, at 12 Wizards. Hopefully by, by the end of this, uh, you're going to have one takeaway that you can take, I guess, and think about and how you can apply it to, to your team as well, hopefully. So to, to kick things off, um, to add a bit of background behind, behind this topic, I thought I could start with, with our vision uh, at, at the engineering group level, so not only a QA chapter. Uh, and for us, uh, from the beginning of time, continuous delivery was, uh, was the goal, it was the vision for us. And continuous delivery is the abil ability to get uh, all type of changes, um, including new features, configuration, uh, bug fixes, anything basically, getting them into production and into the hands of our, our users um, uh, safely and quickly in a sustainable way. So uh, we resonated with this uh, and we thought um, if we have this as a vision, we thought that we should embrace uh, our changes and our processes basically to get it closer, closer to that point. Uh, we didn't want to get the difference with continuous deployment, for example, is that um, you need to be in an environment where you are actually comfortable to make an automate, automated deployment into, into production. And we thought as a starting point, uh, let's see where we get into a continuous delivery. So basically having everything automated uh, and then only a manual step basically that's gonna deploy to production. And if we get there, we know that we're gonna, we're gonna see how we get, get on in a couple of months or we're gonna review the processes that we have to see how we can get the next step further into a continuous deployment. But at least we thought that as a starting point, continuous delivery, it, it's a good start to, to, to think about. Um, and also, um, considering the nature of our business, so uh, we are a small regulated financial uh, advice company in uh, Midlands. Uh, so um, we offer automated financial advice and we are fully regulated by FCA. And um, basically this gets a bit into, uh, as a contradiction with uh, continuous delivery and cont continuous deployment principles. And we thought if we can get into, into a continuous delivery process, um, it means that all the decisions basically that we make at all times need to get us help to help us get closer to closer to it. 
Uh, but then we also need to, to have that step back and think that at the end of the day, we are a regulated financial advice company. So that means that we need to take into account our customers and we need to make sure we still provide suitable advice to our customers uh, at the end of the day. So um, that's the vision. And as I mentioned, as a quality, uh, as a, an engineering group, actually, in, in our team, we thought that if we get ourselves into a continuous delivery pipeline, it means we're going to get into a place where we're comfortable with, with our quality processes, with our engineering um, uh, processes build basically uh, software delivery lifecycle processes. Uh, so if we get into that, it means we're going to be. Um, there is someone that's not actually muted. If you can mute yourself, please. Thank you very much. Um, so we can get ourselves, if we can get ourselves into a continuous del delivery pipeline, it means that we do think about quality across the whole processes and um, we are going to improve the quality overall, not uh, in different stages in, in our pipelines. Um, cool. Um, so our mantra, our goal, I guess, as an engineering group is to actually deliver safely at speed. So uh, as I mentioned, due to the nature of the business, we need to have some level of auditing, some level of traceability. If, for example, FCA comes knocking uh, at our doors, um, since we are fully regulated by them. Um, so this sometimes could feel like a bit, a bit of weight against our mantra to, to have uh, continuous delivery because we, we do want to deliver faster, but then we also need to make sure to uh, we deliver safe. Uh, and as I mentioned, we do deliver um, suitable advice to, to our customers. So what we agreed as, as an engineering group was to actually build a culture of quality across the whole group thinking about quality across all processes, about people. Uh, we also wanted to be automation led. Um, and also we want to look to see how we can get that fast feedback loops rather than waiting uh, until the end of the pipeline. Um, so we always want, want to gather that fast feedback and action, action on it really, really fast. Um, our focus was also in the area of the testing manifesto because um, it resonated with our values. Um, so uh, looking basically testing throughout rather, rather than testing at the end. Um, um, preventing bugs basically rather, rather than raising bugs, finding bugs at the end. Uh, testing understanding rather than checking functionality. Um, and the most important one for us, basically, uh, the team team responsibility for quality rather than rather than testing responsibility. So all these values, actually, this is uh, this is something that Growing Agile uh, created initially and developed. So uh, it really resonated with with our uh, values and our principles. So we thought actually we need to we need to take it into account when we think about our processes. Um, so with all this behind us, we, we tried to create our processes, our vision, and we shared our, our ways of working. And actually, we've, we've been doing this for, for a while. Um, as I mentioned, the testing manifesto was at the heart of our approaches, and um, we were keen to, to shift all these activities uh, left, as, as you can see here. Um, trying to understand actually up front through, through discovery what we're trying to achieve so that we can be a lot faster and we can be a lot more confident in the end when we want to deploy and monitor the features. Um, so um, this is one of our, um, our diagrams in our quality assurance uh, documents uh, where we try actually to, to shift left, basically trying to understand upfront what we're trying to build, as I mentioned. Um, and uh, at the end, with, with, with the help of automation, at the end, it's going to be a lot easier. If you know upfront what, what you're trying to prove, at the end, it's going to be a lot easier to, just to show the evidence that, okay, we agree this, and this is the evidence to show that it's working as expected. Um, and you get that feedback loop really fast. And then the cost to fix is a lot, a lot uh, smaller as well, because if you identify issues at the end, uh, it's going to cost a lot more basically to go through the entire delivery life cycle to, to fix it. And by, by trying to shift left, you, you open discussions, you, you discuss a lot more, you think about more edge cases, and uh, you start thinking and to create that 
that shared understanding up front, basically. So it's a lot easier if the shared understanding wasn't created. It's a lot easier to, um, uh, I don't know, document a finding or something, and you don't need to fix anything because it's just a discussion at that point. Uh, so we we were thinking about all this in our our processes, um, and yet. The reality with all this in mind, having our vision, having our principles thought about for a while uh, now, um, the reality was that um, we were five quality QAs uh, in a team of 12 engineers. Uh, we work in four stream value teams. We are all working in Kanban. Um, uh, we are, uh, just to put a bit of background, we, we are four cross-functional sub-teams, basically, so we have engineers, QA, platform, product, all self-contained, um, and for a long time, basically, we're trying to find our, our own pace, so uh, we had different teams working in different ways, so um, they could... Um, so we can understand exactly how we work together. We can understand uh, some of them worked in Kanban. Actually, all of us are working now in Kanban, but some of them, some of us worked trial different different things. So, in in such a small team, you would think that uh, we do have quite a good ratio. So, as I mentioned, we do have five QAs with twelve engineers uh, in these four teams. So, it's really good ratio. One QA with two, three engineers. They do pair a lot, uh, and it's really good. Um, it's it's really good as well that actually engineers wanted to take more ownership. So um, they want to be part of testing. They they wanted to do to own the work until it's deployed to life, but they didn't quite understand exactly how to do that because um, QAs, for example, were owning the automated checks. They they were owning different different dashboards that test dashboards that we have. Um, they didn't quite know exactly how to run them, uh, what type of automated tests we have, how do they run in what circumstances, uh, test environment configuration. Uh, it was quite difficult, I guess, for them to get comfortable with, with the automated checks that we had. Um, because of that, um, automation was usually left as uh, the last one or even later, and the tests were quite flaky as well. So um, because we didn't quite think about the automated checks at the beginning, um, they were usually postponed because of time or different deadlines, reasons that we had. Uh, and because of that, they, they started to become quite flaky as well. So the team didn't quite trust them as well. So it was quite um, difficult. Uh, and as I mentioned, we did have at all times um, the desire from the team to, to actually take more ownership. Um, what wasn't so good actually in the end was that um, the shared understanding wasn't so shared and it was such a shame because we we were doing as teams a lot of discovery, a lot of analysis up front, so we can shift all these activities left, as I mentioned. Um, and yet, it was still there was still a battle. We're still doing a lot of back and forth between between uh, the development and testing activities. We were identifying issues quite late in the pipelines, and then we, because of the nature of the team, we we had to block everything basically and and fix them. Um, and at the end of the day, the quality engineer was still seen, unfortunately, as a gatekeeper because um, with the best intentions from from the team. Um, at the end of the day, everyone was thinking that, you know what, I've done my best for testing, for example, but I still know I have someone there that is going to uh, do all the testing and uh, again, and they're going to verify and they're going to tell me if I've done something wrong. So we were still seen as a, as a safety net, I guess, at, at the end of the day. Um, it was good uh, because, as I mentioned, the team had really good intentions behind, but it was still taking that ownership basically step back again since we were still counting uh, between us basically from uh, that someone is going to pick up the issues that we might miss, for example. So um, that was the, 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 the reality. And I think this is where we were somewhere last year during, during the summer. Uh, so to resonate again, basically we, um, uh, let me see how to do this, yeah. So the whole team basically wanted, they were really invested to take responsibility for for quality. Uh, they wanted to, to, to be more accountable for the work that they were doing. Uh, but unfortunately, as I mentioned, testing was still seen as, as a phase. We actually had our own column uh, on the boards. Um, and we, 
we still saw ourselves basically as two different different threads. So you have the development pipeline and then you have the quality um, column there on the board where the tester is responsible and they were giving the go no go for any ticket basically that was going through through all boards. So this was basically, as I mentioned, somewhere uh, last year where we were, this was the, the reality of our engineering group. Um, we wanted to do more, but we didn't quite know exactly how to tackle everything. And what happened at one point um, was that actually uh, a, a webinar, we, we discovered a webinar from, from Atlassian. Um, so this webinar, I totally recommend it for for everyone. And actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna have quite a few references from it since we we did take some uh, some of the experiments that we've made were based on on this one. So um, Penny Wyatt is uh, speaking about quality at speed and how Jira does um, QA. They actually call it quality assistance. And I wanted to to show that actually I want to say that actually this webinar was made in 2014. So actually, it's nothing new. Um, it's uh, it's been there for quite a, a long time. It's just we we didn't discover it yet, for example. And um, this slide uh, really resonated with us because um, she mentioned that if you if you bring more QAs into the team, it doesn't mean that you're going to improve quality necessarily. Um, so. Um, it did resonate with us basically because we were thinking that we are actually five quality assurance engineers in a team of 12, 12 uh, engineers. And she's speaking actually how they got into a place where a team of 70 devs basically worked with a team of five QAs. So imagine how we found ourselves when we realized that we do have our team resonated as we have. Uh, so if we wanted to scale up, for example, our engineering group, that did it mean that actually we need to bring more QAs into the team or actually do we need to look at our practices to see how we can work it out better? So basically this was our trigger for us. And we really, really liked the idea behind what they were proposing. So of course we wanted the same, uh, we wanted to trial and actually it was really good because the whole engineering team wanted, wanted to trial this. Uh, why? Because, because of some, some, some of the reasons that she gave as well. So um, she mentions about, she mentions the quality, first of all, because engineers that master testing not only increase the efficiency and capacity of their team, but also write higher quality software. Um, and what she, she's saying with this is that actually, um, if you're thinking up front from, uh, for, about your testing and your testing activities and how you're gonna prove your work, actually, um, if you think that up front, you're going to create the test up front, you're going to prove your, your work a lot faster, and actually you're going to become more efficient because you don't fight anymore uh, all with the back and forth, for example. You, you focus on uh, writing higher quality software up front from the beginning. And then it comes to the second point, because you don't go back and forth all the time, um, you, you don't waste so much time, basically additional time and effort to fix bugs or to rewrite code. Uh, and actually you do have time to be more efficient, to ship faster and actually have conf confidence in your work. Uh, and then the last point that we really liked as well was that uh, uh, independence, because when testing can be confidently shared between the team, the people who are passionate about quality, such as, as uh, great testers, they can focus on solving the root causes of quality problems in addition to discovering their symptoms. So what we, we, we talked about was to actually share testing responsibilities to, to our team, and then us as quality engineers, we can focus more basically on trying to help them become more efficient and um, trying to see how we can fasten basically those, uh, I don't know, test run times, automation platform. Uh, so looking basically how we can support the team into delivering, delivering even, even faster. Um, so the, their reasons, uh, this, this page basically uh, resonated, really hit a chord with us and we, we really wanted to, to give it a try. So this leads into the second part, basically, where we're going to speak about the experiments that we've done. Um, and before actually showing you the experiments that we've done, um, we wanted, we need to understand basically where we were at that point in time, uh, where we want to be, and then how will we measure 
if we got there. So we needed a way to objectively analyze and learn when changing our processes uh, and our ways of working. Uh, because throughout the year, we did quite a few experiments and we wanted to, we wanted to analyze how we're doing, not only have, um, I don't know, feel of it. So actually, we, we put a lot of effort from the beginning into metrics. We wanted to understand basically where we were at the beginning. And then, uh, as I mentioned, um, trying to understand basically, trying to see how the experiments are evolving, are helping us or not necessarily helping us. Um, so yeah, if, if you can measure it, you can improve it because uh, you don't have that objective basically uh, reasoning behind it. And it's a lot more easier to open a discussion when you do have the data uh, up front. Um, the, the next point basically will be the visibility. So we're gonna see how you can make everything available for analysis. Uh, and then you can start experimenting. So uh, try to learn and adapt along the way and see what works for you, what doesn't work for you. Um, cool, so if we start going into the metrics, uh, the first one and the most popular one, I guess, is the cycle time. So um, I think quite a few, quite a few teams, um, actually all the teams are looking at, uh, at cycle time. So what we've done, we, we started to count when, when a ticket was picked up basically to be implemented. So when it was getting into in progress, um, and then we were looking until the ticket was ready to, to be shipped. We didn't initially want it to look uh, at cycle time up to live deployment, because at that point in time, uh, we used to do more often train releases, bulking up basically a couple of, a number of tickets and a number of stories in a release and sending them, uh, basically deploying them every every couple of days. Um, we didn't want this basically to, to hinder our data, our metrics. So, um, because we, we kind of knew at that point um, that we are comfortable, uh, that there was uh, a slight delay basically in the release process. Um, so what we said was that as a starting point, let's, let's look at uh, cycle time between in progress and ready to ship. And once we're gonna implement that, and once we're gonna be comfortable with that, we're gonna also gonna look at the, uh, how we can improve the release time. Um, and what data shows, uh, what this shows here, I'm gonna look a bit here, is uh, so this, um, this is actually a metric from Jira, so definitely you you can uh, you can find it. I think it's a setting. If you go in Jira, um, I think it's reports. Uh, you're gonna find it there. Um, so this data is displayed between January and August last year, and what it shows it's quite difficult was uh, that actually the cycle time between in progress and ready to ship on average was really really high. So um, we had around 11, 12 days. Uh, basically to, to have something ready to ship. Of course, there were loads of things to, to consider here, um, depending on the complexity of our work. Uh, we were taking a user-centric focus on, on our tickets, for example, our stories. Uh, being financial uh, services, they were quite complex as well. So, um, um, but still 11, 12 days was, was quite high for us. We, that's why we started all this process in the first place. As a median, around uh, six, seven days, so um, around a week, I would say. And usually that, that was the feel in, in the team. Of course, we did have quite complex things. And actually you can see uh, around here, uh, through the end, actually we did hit quite a couple of complex things. And as I mentioned, um, this is when we hit our our point to say, actually, we do need to change a couple of things because it was taking quite a bit of time. Um, cool. So this is uh, this is the cycle time. This is the first metric that we used, and uh, the other one that actually we we looked at as well was the story rejection rate. So um, this is actually something that Ecclesian are speaking about uh, in in their webinar. And I did find it quite important, and we did find it quite important as well as a team, because it can complement the cycle time uh, metric. And what's, what this metric is, is a percentage of stories that have to go back for bug fixing or rework. And actually, we did want you to see how how our uh, our tickets basically are transitioning, because as, as we've seen, 
we did have a median of six days, seven days, basically, as a cycle time. So definitely we knew something was happening there that was taking too long. So we thought to actually start looking at this metric as well to see how often the tickets are actually going back instead of going forward. So we can actually try to try to fix that one. Um, so the way we interpret this, uh, this metric is basically how many tickets we do have uh, in a month, how many tickets basically we, we uh, progress through in a month. Um, so let's say, for example, uh, if we have 100 tickets, uh, from those ones, um, if it sh they should only transition once in uh, basically through each stage. So let's say the testing stage, for example. Uh, as you can see in, in this one here, um, this one is the data displayed per quarter. So what it means is in the second quarter, um, so between uh, June and August, uh, July, sorry, July, September. Uh, so what we see in, in the second quarter for us, actually, uh, the testing phase had a story rejection rate of 63%. And what it means is from 100 tickets, let's say, uh, that were transitioning through, through the board that month, 63 of them were going back for rework. So that means basically 63% uh, of our time was dealing with fixing defects or re uh, rewriting or, um, I don't know, um, misunderstanding uh, of some level to, to our tickets. Or maybe 50 of them would go back more than once because we've had situations where um, a, a story would go back and forth basically quite a few times in uh, through, through the boards. Um, that's really, really high level, I guess, uh, how it's presented. Depending, depending on the tools that you use for your test management, there are different ways, I guess, to, to track it. Uh, we used our JIRA transitions, so that means you do need a bit of discipline, basically transitioning the stories throughout, uh, throughout the board. But once we have the data and once we actually looked at it and once we implemented this metric, it was really eye-opening for us because 63% basically to go back and forth, it's quite a lot of time basically wasted instead of looking at new work, looking at new features. Um, so retrospectively, basically more than half of our time as a team was wasted on fixing bugs. And then by fixing bugs, basically we had to rewrite everything, so on and so forth. So we did understood that this was something that we needed to start with because 63% of our time was wasted and we wanted to, we wanted to decrease that one. Cool, so we did have these two metrics as a starting point for us. And after implementing them, um, it was, as I mentioned, it was really easy to start discussions in the team because we did, we did take this approach of discussing as a team to see how we can improve um, our processes and our ways of working. Um, so we started looking at what we can trial so we can improve this data. We wanted to improve these numbers. We wanted you to, to be better. Uh, so we took the equation examples and we trialed different, different ways of working. Um, what I'm gonna do, I'm not gonna show a full timeline and uh, a list of experiments that we've done, but only basically a, a couple of key bits that worked for us. Hopefully they're gonna work for you as well. But before that, I'm also gonna show you another metric that we actually, uh, are looking at currently, uh, and that is the release cadence. So um, basically we wanted to look at how often basically we were releasing um, because we, as I mentioned, the vision for us was to have a continuous delivery pipeline. So that means we, sh we should be able to, to be releasing on a daily basis. Uh, and this is a really simple, if you're using Jira, for example, it's really si simple to, to add to your Jira dashboards. Um, uh, it's a Jira issues calendar and it's going to look at all the versions basically that you released uh, and it's really, it's highlighting basically that we were doing some releases, they were happening, but they weren't happening every day. They were, as I mentioned, they were quite bulking up basically a couple of stories um, and we, we wanted to improve, as I mentioned, and we wanted to see how we can, how we can do better. So if uh, I'm the next phase would be talking about a couple of experiments that we made, as I mentioned, and a couple of techniques that we used. Um, the first one that I'm gonna go through is a test kickoff. 
And if you're familiar with Three Amigos, uh, definitely you're going to be familiar with, with this one. So uh, we wanted to move shift left, or we wanted to shift left, we wanted to understand up front the work and uh, understand the test approach. Um, but not sure we, we tried Three Amigos before, it's just, it, it never stick with us. Uh, and what this session uh, that Atlassian presented is that it's an ad hoc session right before picking up new work. So um, basically, before picking picking something up, we would have something like this. We, we put it on the board as well, so it can be visible for everyone. Um, so we were discussing risks, edge cases up front before, before implementation started. So um, getting the engineers thinking about the risks, getting uh, to think about the testing impact up front, um, it, it did improve over time our thinking about testing uh, overall. Um, this session should only take five, 10 minutes, depending on the complexity. Uh, as I mentioned, we were doing a lot of analysis and grooming up front before this, and basically this is more defining the final details before actually uh, implementing them. So uh, we were discussing the test approach details, the test impact, the, the types of automated checks, different scenarios to be, to be covered. Um, it, it was really good because pairing with developers basically encouraged them to think about uh, the risks, about the edge cases up front uh, before they start implementing the story implementation. Um, different um, implementation choices, for example, can be influ influenced by, by these requirements um, and actually problems were, were prevented earlier on. So um, we were brainstorming basically together to come up with different testing notes uh, and sort out different, different queries or ambiguities that we were having from the start. Um, and um, this was really good basically because uh, we, we wanted to work together. We wanted to, to make engineers more aware of, of testing practices. And actually we were identifying what type of automated checks we're gonna implement as well. Um, so we can, we can implement them during, during the work and then they would help us basically with uh, proving the work at the end. Um, the other technique that we implement implemented as well and this is actually a term that really sticked with us and again it comes from the occasion experiments is dotting as we call it now um, and uh, the idea here is that you would have a, a developer on testing duties um, so assigning a developer on test is a good way basically to, to introduce engineers to the idea of testing, improve their skills and make it explicit that quality is actually everyone's responsibility. These doesn't mean they're gonna be experts from day one because uh, they're not and uh, they're not comfortable as well. So it does take a lot of uh, learning, a lot of pairing so they can be, they become more comfortable doing testing and then us QAs basically trusting our engineers as well. Um, it does it does prevent basically the problem of a QA engineer being the bottleneck in the team and then having that safety net as well. So actually promoting this idea of uh, testing is everyone's responsibility. That means you need to be comfortable doing your own testing. Um, this, uh, this basically um, introduces the idea that um, everyone is, uh, everyone is uh, responsible, everyone is accountable. Uh, and then long-term, we want to feel confident basically that the original developer has sufficiently tested for the risks outlined in the testing node. Uh, so definitely it was complementing the first phase. So we were doing the test kickoff and then based on those notes, the developer was doing his own testing or another developer. So um, I think Atlassian are mentioning this phase as, as a beginning, another de developer would be doing uh, the testing. Uh, and that's good because you would have the second pair of eyes, for example. Uh, that, for example, didn't work for us. So what we do is actually the same developer takes responsibility, takes accountability for the story throughout the life cycle. So he's really involved in the kickoff, in the implementation phase, in the testing phase as well. And then it brings us to the next phase, which is the demo side. So if he does all these activities by himself, he, he would be quite comfortable at the end that, okay, this work seems to be working. 
So at the end, uh, we, we as a group, we decided to add a demo phase where actually he would discuss with a quality engineer um, a review basically of what he did, uh, the new feature, what type of changes he made, and then the testing evidence for feedback. Um, this session as well, it's ad hoc on demand based on the type of changes. Uh, and it should only take five minutes. And usually we bring together uh, the product um, um, as well. Uh, and he, he would get a slide basically overview over what we implemented, get some feedback as well. So basically it would close that feedback loop as well. Um, um, it was really useful, especially at the beginning. So we don't feel the need as much of doing these. Definitely we do demos to tour product and BAs. Uh, but it was really useful at, at the beginning because um, our engineers were quite comfortable with the change, but they still wanted to have that second pair of eyes, for example, to, to get some feedback from it. So it was really good at the beginning uh, to gain trust between between uh, us developers and uh, QAs as well. Um, they were feeling that they might miss bits, so they still wanted that safety net. And um, it's, it's uh, basically a, a five, 10 minute session. It doesn't take uh, much time anyway. So it, it was a really good thing that we, we added it to our wor workflows. Uh, in time, we, we identified that actually we didn't have much time for exploratory. Uh, because if we're doing the demo, we were quite comfortable to, to ship the work. And um, at the team level, at one point, again, to make everyone think about the exploratory testing as well, to, to get them comfortable, uh, we decided to actually make it a phase on the board where we, I don't know, we, we put a time box uh, as well ad hoc when something is finished um, before actually shipping the feature. And um, we would do an exploratory session together where we, we um, Again, we would pair, so to learn more tips and tips on, on, on this exploratory testing skills, um, we would try to break the feature and different different activities basically to, 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 to actually get even more comfortable that the, the feature is ready to go. So by the time we get to this point, we do quite a few activities, basically, as you've seen. So uh, we do uh, analysis up front, we, we do test kickoffs, we do have implementation, the developer himself does testing as well. Um, they, we do exploratory as a team. So actually as a team, we were getting quite comfortable in time. Um, and we got into a point where actually we realized, well, why not actually ship it? Because I, I'm quite comfortable with it. We've done all this testing already. I do have all the evidence. We implemented automation part of our pipelines because actually if we think up front what we're going to test, how we're going to test it, what scenarios we're going to automate, uh, we were working together to, to create those testing um, uh, scenarios and the automation scenarios. So by the end of it, we were quite comfortable to say, actually, why not actually ship it? Because we know. Um, so in the end, we, we looked into how we can add release part of the whole delivery process and how we can make it simple enough to not lose a lot of time doing, doing it daily. So actually, we looked how we can automate the entire release process so we can make it even, even faster. So these were a couple of techniques that we implemented. Um, we trialed, some of them didn't even work. Uh, we all the time looked at the data as well. Um, and what we came up with in the end uh, was a visualization of our entire workflow uh, that actually does help us today to, to identify bottlenecks. So uh, we trialed quite, quite a few of these things uh, for, for quite a few months now. Um, and this is how currently, this is how our JIRA board, for example, looks like. Uh, we wanted to see where the time is wasted. So we needed to understand basically where exactly we lose the time. Um, so as I mentioned, when something, something is uh, ready, we do our test kickoff sessions where the QA, QEs pair with engineering and with product and they do discuss risks, uh, edge cases up front, test approach agreed. 
um, and then we, we get into in development. So again, we do pair a lot there, especially at the beginning. Uh, our engineers are creating the, the automated acceptance test as well. So uh, they, they started to pick up a lot more from that. And actually we did pair a lot at the beginning and it did take a lot of time at the beginning. Um, you know, to, to get past that learning curve. But in time, everyone got more comfortable with everything. And actually our engineers know where our automated checks are today and they, they know how to run them. And actually we did improve a lot in our infrastructure to, to support uh, that. Uh, the next phase, once, once they implemented the code and they implemented the, um, the test as well, they, they go into the testing phase. So they, um, they do their own testing uh, of the story uh, using testing notes, using uh, their own explore testing, testing skills. As I mentioned, we do a lot of pairing as well on that until they, they became comfortable by themselves. Uh, and then we continue into a demo state where they, they do, it's just a brief discussion with the quality engineer and the PO to say, this is what we've done. This is the evidence that's going to um, promote that that work. Uh, we do some exploratory when we need to, uh, so we can basically we want it, we do, we are automation led, but at the end of the day, we still understand that the exploratory testing is a, is a massive and important um, activity. So we wanted to make sure it's part of our pipeline. And by the time we get into, into the exploratory, basically once we complete that, we are quite comfortable. So actually we do ship it as well. Um, and by having it visible, by having it here, everything visible, we do, uh, we do look at our data, we do look, look at our metrics, and we do understand it a lot better. It's a lot easier to visualize it because you do have, so what we acknowledge now, now is that all these are phases that we need to go through together as a team. So it's not in testing phase that it's um, uh, owned by a QA, it's actually in testing phase that means you need to prove your work. So uh, we shifted a, a bit the mindset, basically trying to understand um, what the board looks like and what it wants to present. And it's a lot easier to, to open discussions once you have it, uh, once you have it presented and uh, visual. Uh, and as I mentioned, the last bit is learning and adapting. So uh, do a lot of experiments. Um, we had metrics basically to, to understand them. So we adjusted all the time. We changed and we looked again at the data. And we've seen during, during these uh, experiments, basically because we had the metrics to, um, to back us up, it was really, really uh, easy for us basically to understand from, to, to, to learn from these experiments. Um, it's really important to mention that uh, at the beginning, uh, our QAs were having less time than before, as I mentioned, because they were pairing a lot more, they were reviewing work, they, they were in a lot more sessions. Uh, so at the beginning, the learning curve basically, um, it, it was taking a lot of time and a lot of effort, but then in time, um, we are there more for, for support rather than being there all the time. So definitely it does take a lot of time. And as, as we like to call it handholding um, during, during this learning, learning curve as well. Um, we've done a lot of pairing and actually we still do a lot of pairing between QAs uh, with the testing skills, basically with engineers uh, trying basically to, to work together better uh, and uh, to make them comfortable to test their own work. And uh, the last point that it's really, really important, uh, it's a team effort. We, the mutual trust and respect basically is really, really important in a team. That ability to, to discuss openly, to, to try things, to, to experiment and learn. And actually it comes back to the point as well to, to take retrospectives really seriously for learning opportunities. So we, we used to have quite uh, difficult discussions in our retros. Um, but we, we got where we are today because it was a team effort because everyone actually was bought into this and we said, okay, we need to do something. We need to improve. Uh, and with all these experiments, with all these retrospectives, we improved bit by bit. So where we are today, 
actually uh, today we are in in a position where we did increase a lot our feature automated checks coverage uh, because as I mentioned now um, the automated checks are taking a, a, on board part of our implementation phases uh, so they're not a second level citizen for example they they are there uh, we create them alongside the work we do have loads of test dashboards alerts for visibility we did create loads of integrations in slack emails jira um, just to make it a lot easier for us to understand where we are and to get the status updates. Uh, we do have a full team ownership over automated test packs because uh, we did pair a lot more. Uh, they do create those tests, uh, those checks as well. So they they got into a point where actually they are comfortable with uh, what they do, how to run them, how we can run them automatically as well. Um, and uh, we actually improved a lot from, from this perspective. Uh, we start conversations with testability in mind because if you start discussing up front how you can improve and how you're going to test this piece of work, we actually think a lot more, okay, if I need to test it this way, this means I need to design it in a way that I'm going to be able to test it easily. Uh, we, we do a lot of testing through the APIs, so um, testability is in mind all the time for us. And actually, we do always look at improving our overall processes because we know we're not even close to continuous delivery yet, but um, we are getting a lot better at that. And the data actually backed us up. Uh, so this is the metric of story uh, rejection rate. And what we can see here is by the end of the fourth quarter, so by the end of December, actually our story rejection rate got as low as 19%. So actually we did have almost 40% of, um, of a drop in our story rejection rate. So um, we, we already felt a lot more comfortable as a team, but actually data backed us up. We, we've seen an improvement. And actually, so as I mentioned, the, the engineers were now creating automated checks. They were doing their own testing. And actually we became even more, even more efficient and we didn't have so much back and forth anymore. So it was really good to see the data actually showing these improvements. 40%, uh, it's a, it was a massive thing for us in just a couple of months. Um, this is the same metric, but actually per, per month. And if you can see here in August, and actually even before that, we did have our test phases basically. So all the tickets were going back at least once. They were getting close to 100%. And by the time we got to, to December, all the test phases were lower than 30%. So actually we're, we weren't looking only at um, the in-testing phase. We were looking at all those phases on the board and uh, we've seen a massive, quite, quite a drop, I guess, in the back and forth that we were having. Maybe because we were taking that time up front to, to understand what we're doing. The release cadence. Um, We've seen that actually we started releasing a lot more often. So actually we started making multiple releases a day. Uh, we were making smaller changes, lower impact, and the team was a lot more comfortable doing releases every day. So actually we do multiple releases a day. Uh, and actually because of that, we, we moved our cycle time to move from in progress until it's done. Uh, we're still not there yet. So we do have, for example, a median of uh, four or five days now, but definitely we've seen an improvement uh, in all of this. So to fast forward, uh, because I know, I know the time is uh, our enemy, uh, the last phase, what do our QAs do now? So if the devs own their work, they own their own testing, what do they do now? And um, in time, um, we decided to change the name of our chapter from quality assurance engineers to quality engineering because we didn't quite identify with it anymore. And it was actually a contradiction with our new principles. If the whole team was taking responsibility, assuring quality, why should you have a team that's called quality assurance? Um, so we, we actually evolved into, into new roles. We are looking how we can enable the teams to establish and ensure the quality of the platform basically is developed. We offer our T-shaped basically expertise from our testing backgrounds. 
uh, we we offer a lot of support, as I mentioned, organizing, prioritizing, testing within within uh, the teams, and we also do a lot of research, basically trying to drive adoption and guidance on on best practices in in our teams, basically how we can improve. Uh, all the processes that we have, not only testing uh, automation as well. Uh, we're looking at ways of working, so we're looking at metrics, reportings, uh, automation in testing is really important for us, continuous integration, uh, technical leadership as well, because at the end of the day, we do have the expertise on that, uh, and overall testing strategies. Um, does the name matter? Uh, for a long time, I thought it doesn't. But actually, it's a lot more than just testing. Um, we do have this false conception that QEs are quality gatekeepers. Um, we wanted to acknowledge that actually everyone is responsible for quality assurance. Not uh, you don't have someone responsible for that. So that's why we wanted to uh, to take a step back and actually look at all the processes that we have. We wanted to acknowledge our quality engineers new responsibilities because everyone takes pride in their job. Uh, so we wanted to make sure everyone knows about this. Um, so coming back to the initial questions, do we assure quality? Yes, we do, all of us. Um, who is responsible for this quality? All of us, it's a shared team responsibility. And how is this quality assured? Uh, throughout looking throughout all the engineering processes. So it does take a lot of time, a lot of effort, um, and you need to take it as a whole team basically to see how you can improve everything. Um, I mentioned quite a few references. Uh, if you want to take a screenshot, I guess over this, um, um, I also added links on the slides, but um, yeah. If you want to look, definitely have a look uh, into a bit more details. Uh, thank you very much. I know we took quite a bit of time, um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you again. If you, we can go into questions now. If I can find how I can get into the questions. Oh, I do find it here. Uh, should I just go through them, Bella? Uh, choo -choo -choo -choo. Yeah, that would be great. There's a, there's a few just at the bottom of the uh, chat that people have asked. Perfect. Uh, I'm going to go from the bottom then. So uh, when you proposed dotting, did you have devs saying that testing was in their work and uh, that if they had to test, then you had to develop? <laughs> Everyone asked me this. Um, yes. So from, from the four teams, we actually started the experiment in uh, uh, a couple of them, not all of them, but what we've seen, uh, so we did had quite a, quite a lot of buy-in and that's why I mentioned it's a team effort and we wouldn't be here if some engineers wouldn't want to trial this with us. Um, we, when we started basically uh, the experiments, we, we've seen only, we looked only at one team um, and in time when we've seen the improvements, what we've seen is that actually everyone wanted to actually be part of the journey. Uh, so definitely, definitely there are going to be situations where um, you're going to have engineers that uh, maybe uh, they're comfortable in their own ways of working. Um, uh, and that's why it takes a lot of pairing, for example, to, to bring them through the journey and having that safe environment. It's really important, basically creating that culture of uh, celebration and feedback, because uh, as I mentioned, we do take retrospectives and we do discuss openly uh, that uh, maybe, um, uh, I don't know, some uh, the engineers don't do enough testing, for example. So we need to pick that up again uh, and keep the momentum. Uh, it's... It, I know it's a struggle and that's why it's really important to have the data because um, at the beginning we showed that actually 63% of our, our stories were going back and forth. And basically we wanted to see it to be more efficient. So we wanted to see how we can improve the processes uh, and having that data definitely raises, opens the discussion uh, a lot more objective because I'm not here a tester complaining that you don't do enough testing. Actually, I do have a lot of data to show that we need to become more efficient in our ways of working. I don't know if it answered the question. It's a really difficult one. I think you should try the experiment usually with a team, a smaller team, and then uh, see how you can actually expand it to, to the whole team, especially if they're going to see how well it's, it's done. They're going to they're gonna want to be in the journey as well. 
Um, hi, Stu. Uh, so a couple of questions. Uh, what does path to live now look like in terms of stages, test environments, and deployment, though? And how does your workflow fit into this? Uh, I'm not sure I followed the question. What does... So, yeah, so hi there. So basically there. what... Um, I'm, I'm going to put my camera on because I can't speak without my camera on. <laughs> so basically, in terms of your pipeline now um, and the processes you've been to and the experiments and the change in your workflow to get from A to B, um, I'm just curious to know how your, your pipeline is shaping up in, in supporting that um, within the automation and the stages and the, however many environments you go through and things like that. Yes. So um, we do, uh, so our pipeline actually tries to visualize and that's why we, I think visualization is really important. So we do have all the phases between in progress and in live uh, and everything that we need to do in between. So uh, we do work in microservices architecture. So that means we do a lot of testing in branches, basically locally uh, on um, uh, developer um, a Docker container. And then in the CI, we do have a lot of testing there as well. Uh, we did integrate a lot more. So we used to have a lot more um, system integration tests. Actually, we started looking how we can bring them closer. Uh, so by having these activities and by having the engineers involved in the testing, uh, we started having more discussions over how we can improve the, the overall testing process. Um, so um, we do a lot of testing in branches, for example. A lot of automation is triggered automatically uh, when uh, a new feature, for example, is um, uh, ready. Um, and then we also have a uh, UAT environment, staging environment. So um, once uh, so once exploratory is done, we are ready to be shipped. And that means we're going to take the release, uh, the new version of the service. We're going to put it into the staging environment. We're going to trigger automatically loads of tests depending on the change. So actually, we did improve our workflows. Uh, um, basically, a deployment is going to trigger automatically. It's going to look, OK, the change is made into this service. So that means I'm going to trigger these automated tests, uh, API, UI, depending on uh, what type of change you have. Uh, and at that point, that's the manual trigger for us. We're going to review that release evidence and say, OK, we're fine. We're going to ship it into red, or we're not fine. Um, I hopefully, hopefully it answered, answered the yeah. question. Yeah, it did, yeah. Perfect. Uh, where does performance testing considerations and execution fit into this? Um, so currently, the performance testing isn't in, isn't included in our overall pipeline. So actually, it's an activity that we do it from time to time. For example, outside of this, uh, we did have discussion actually. Um, once we improved our acceptance testing and functional testing activities, we did start looking to see how actually we can bring more non-functional requirements into our pipelines as well. So basically we're trying as well, we're trying to see how we can make them automatically triggered by different deployments basically and how we can be alerted by, by them. Um, but yeah, currently it's, um, it's a separated basically activity. Um, that's, uh, it's done automatically, but it's still manually triggered. Great, thank you. No worries. Uh, let me see if I can answer a couple more. Um, I don't know. Um, I really like the idea of test kickoff versus the three amigos. It sounds like QE drives initiates this meeting. Um, so yeah, we did try uh, three amigos as well, but it was really difficult. I really don't know why it didn't stick. Maybe the name, I, I have no idea what it happened because behind the scenes is quite the same idea. At the beginning, yes, we were driving it because um, you get that feeling, oh, do I need to do it? Uh, we, we had situations where actually, you know, it's a general workflow. You can just pass it, for example. Um, but in time, uh, what we've seen is that doing, enforcing it, basically that's what we've done as a team. We enforced it and we were doing it all the time. At the beginning, yes, uh, the QA was driving it to say, okay, how we're gonna get comfortable with this? What type of test do we need to do? Basically at, at raising different type of questions that would make everyone to think, okay, how we're gonna approach testing. Doing this all over again, every day on every ticket, in a couple of weeks, in a couple of months, you're going to see a shift because actually now engineers are picking that up and they're saying, okay, I'm going to pick this work. Um, 
how am I going to tackle it? How am I going to test it? How am I going to prove the work that I'm doing? So actually, everyone takes now ownership of this phase because they started, everyone as a team, they started to see the value behind it. Uh, and it's just that matter of practice because uh, it was a long time when, as I mentioned, uh, it did take time, I guess, to um, to get ourselves comfortable with, with it. I don't know if it answered the question, hopefully. Um, yes, it's going to be, we are going to have a recording. Do, do, do. Did I, did I answer everything? I don't think, is there another one? Uh, I love post-outing. Did you have Dev saying that? Do, 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 do. I love that approach of trying it in a guinea pig team. Um, yeah, so, um, the dotting activity um, was definitely a trial. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we were we were having another engineer picking the testing activity, but it was a pairing at the end of the day, basically a quality engineer was pairing with the developer. Um, but in time, we've seen that actually, because we were doing the test kickoff a lot better, they were comfortable uh, picking up their, their uh, work by themselves and they were more comfortable doing their own testing. Also, they were doing automated checks as well. They, were impl they are implementing them by themselves. So, um, of course, uh, they, were, they are a lot more comfortable in picking up testing activities. Um, it, another developer didn't work for us just because they needed to be in the same context, I guess. So you need to be in the context of the work, depending on the complexity. You need to know about the discussion and um, the risks basically highlighted in, in the test kickoff sessions. Um, and it, it just didn't work. Uh, but that's why, for example, and the ultimate goal is the same developer to to be responsible for that piece of work. So actually him, do, him her doing the same testing um, is, is a good uh, approach or at least it, it worked now. Um, I don't know if I missed any questions, feel free to unmute and uh, tell me. I don't know exactly. Thank you, thank you for the feedback. I know it was a bit fast forwarded. Um, I, I had a couple of sessions with it now and I got some really great feedback and now I'm gonna, I'm ready, I guess, to make it a bit more focused on, on different um, topics. Uh, at this point was more presenting the whole journey that we had and I thought it's a good opportunity to, to present it again uh, today. Um, yeah, I don't think if I missed any question, I think that's pretty much all. Brilliant. Uh, well, thank, thank you very much, Ioana. I uh, really enjoyed that talk and it's great to see um, yeah, such positive feedback throughout the comments. Um, just to let everyone know, we have recorded the session. It will be up on uh, Expertise Recruitment's YouTube page, which I'll share the recording of on our meetup page. Um, Iwana, if anyone's got any other questions, are you happy for them to reach out to you on LinkedIn, Twitter? Yes, definitely Twitter. feel free to send me a message on LinkedIn. Um, I have a Twitter as well, but I'm not the best at it. Um, but yeah, feel free to, to uh, or on the Meetup page as well, feel free to answer any, uh, to send me any questions and I definitely can try to go into more details. Brilliant. Well, a huge thank you, Iwana. Uh, that thank was you great. everyone and for attending. Very much, everyone. Cheers, guys. Bye. Thank you again. Bye.